Yes, thank you, Lord, indeed. And Jonah, chapter 1, we'll begin our reading at verse 7. And you'll find that on page 799 if you're using a pew Bible. What we know of this prophet, we know that he had gotten explicit instruction from the Lord to do a thing. And he decided in his mind, in his heart, and even in his flesh that he was not going to do it. And we see that he went on a ship and went the opposite way, figuring he could run from the Lord. That Because what he wanted him to do was minister to some enemies of Israel. And he chose or made up, made up his mind that he was not going to be obedient to what God was telling him to do. And listen, I had shared with you before in regard to how I actually got in this book. I was planning on going elsewhere. The Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and, and had me to preach through this book. And listen, I, I said that somebody here needs to hear something about this prophet. And listen, I know one of the somebodies was me, so I'm guilty. And I pray as we go through here, if God is speaking to your heart in regard to what he does with this prophet, I pray that you will be obedient and do what he's called you or asked you to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jonah chapter 7, I'm sorry, chapter 1. Beginning at verse 7. If you're there, please say amen. 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 And he writes here, he says, And they cried everyone to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause <laughs> this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And listen, that was an antiquated way that they would use in trying to figure things out like almost... Um, Drawing straws in the short straw would be the one who was the winner or the loser, as it were. And, of course, we know that God already had targeted Jonah, knew where he was going, knew he was trying to run, and knew, in fact, that these men were going to be freaking out. And we saw earlier that they were calling on their gods. In other words, little g, all of them were worshiping in some religion, but none of them, with the exception of this prophet, knew the true and living God. So they drew lots, it fell on Jonah, and by the way, who do you think caused that lot to fall on Jonah? None other than God himself. In verse 8 it said, then, they said uh, then said they unto him, tell us, we pray, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence cometh thou? In other words, where are you coming from? And listen, they're hitting him with a, a bevy of questions in rapid-fire succession. He says, what is thy country, and of what people art thou? And, and listen, they're hitting him real quick, because they don't have a lot of time. These waves are rising. And, and by the way, I had said before they were fishers. They weren't. They weren't fishermen, they, but they were, they were experienced sailors who had seen all kinds of storms. But this one in particular is one they had never seen before. And they're recognizing or beginning to recognize that it has divine properties in regard to this storm this because there's nothing like they've ever seen. So in rapid fire succession, they ask him all these questions. And Jonah explains in verse 9, he says, And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew. And look, I said last week when he said that, look, they didn't know his God, but they knew of his people and they knew of his God. And the moment he said he was a Hebrew, I guarantee you he got their attention. He goes on. And I fear the Lord. Take notice, capital L-O-R-D. Talking about Jehovah God. He goes on. He says, the God of heaven, which had made the sea and the dry land. And listen, what he's doing is pointing these pagan sailors. He's pointing them toward the true and living God. And boldly, look, he's not going to lie at this point. He's telling them who he is, and he's telling them the reason for this storm is because the God of the Israelites, the God of the Hebrews, the true and living God, has allowed this storm, and it's because of me. And one of the points I made last week as well, guys, that our sin not only affects us, but it affects everyone in the house, everyone in our proximity. Everyone, wherever we are, it affects them as well. In verse 9, he says, and, and he says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then, look what it says. 
were the men not just afraid, it says exceedingly afraid. And look, they already knew they had a well of a, a storm coming up, but now they're realizing they have a habit of a storm that's coming up. And they're afraid because they realize the true and living God has allowed this storm and they know they can get away with a whole lot of things. They can beat a whole lot of things. They can get through a whole lot of things. But they can't get through what's going on between them and this prophet of God and this storm that God has allowed. In verse 10 it says, Then they were, uh, the men were exceedingly afraid and said unto him, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And listen, they believed him because when they saw that storm, they realized this was no ordinary storm. In verse 11 it says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And listen, they knew it was an ordinary storm. They knew they couldn't stop it. So they're asking God's man, what can we do? And in verse 12, he gives them a solution. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. And listen, I dare say this, this prophet is actually prophesying correctly here. He knows that it's because of him. And look, rather than say, look, take me back to the shore. Let me get off. I'll go and go to Nineveh. I'll do what God told me. He said, no, he's going to carry this thing all the way out. Just take and kill me. Let this thing be over. And then that will be that. The sea will calm. You'll be okay. You'll live. And, and perhaps even I'll die. And that'll be the end of it. But guys, with God... He doesn't think like we do. He doesn't work like we do. And look, he's commissioned this man to do something. And guess what? One way or the other, he's going to do it. Think about my life. And I dare say sometimes I think about your life. And I wonder sometimes in my life and even in your life, if there's always seems like something going on, perhaps the Lord has called you to do something called you to not do something, called you to go somewhere, called you to not go somewhere, called you to get right with someone, called you to get a, a right fellowship with him, or whatever it may, may be, perhaps the Lord has caused a storm in your life as well. He says in verse 13, Nevertheless, and listen, he already told them what he, they need to do. Throw me overboard, this thing is going to stop. And they didn't want to do that, especially after hearing that he was God's prophet. In verse 13, he said, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not. And, and listen, I don't know if, in, if you've ever been in the ocean and you've been caught like in a riptide and, and you're trying to get in and this thing is not letting you in. And the harder you struggle, the farther out you go. This is where these guys are going. It's like their oars have holes in them, and they're pulling, and they're stroking, and this boat ain't going nowhere. In fact, it is getting worse. The verse says, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. And surely it was tempestuous against them. It, it was working against them because God was working against them. And, and, and by the way, guys, there's a verse in John 15 and 5b that simply says that without me, ye can do nothing. And look, these sailors need the blessings of the Lord. And look, they asked his prophet what they should do. And they already he already told them what they should do. And they don't want to do it. And listen, because of that, they're going to try to work it even that much harder. And it's still not working out. And they're realizing that they got to do what this prophet has called them to do or caused them to do. And, and, and listen, that's the only way that they're going to get the blessings of God for this storm to stop. In verse 14, Jonah writes, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord. Take note, it says L-O-R-D, capital, the true and living God, before they were calling on their own individual, secular, earthly gods, but they've just been in introduced by a rough sea to the true and living God, and they're calling on him. It says, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, verse 14, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, 
and let us not, not let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, look what they say, O Lord, have done as it pleased thee. And, and listen, they're calling out to the true and living God. They've already turned their backs on their little guys and they're calling on him because they've made up their mind. If we want to live, we're going to have to be obedient to God through his prophet and throw this man overboard. And they don't want no repercussions from God for throwing his prophet over the board. It says in verse 15, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And look what happens. And the sea ceased from her raging. And, and listen, what I, what I know, that in fact, there's a verse in, in, in Hebrews 12 and 6 that it says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And, and guys, he did it with the Old Testament prophets and saints, and he does it with us as well. And, and I don't know if he had, in fact, in, in, our, Bible, in our Bible class yesterday, we, I had some pictures of this great big whale. This thing was huge. I don't know if it was the same one, but this thing was huge, and, and it's capable, surely, of swallowing a man. Guys, you might not find yourself in the belly of a great fish, but you surely might find yourself in some storms that you can't figure out just where the source of these storms are. Can I suggest, like this prophet came to understand, that you might have to look upward and you might have to call on the true and living God, the L-O-R-D, capital God, and ask him the source of what's going on in your life. He says in verse 15, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then, verse 16 says, the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. And, and guys, that's amazing. In this heaven of a storm, this prophet had to be thrust into the sea. Because God knew exactly where he was and knew exactly what he needed in order for him to do what he needed him to do. But, but I love the Lord because he can work both sides against his middle. And, and in the midst of this man going into the water, you had these ungodly secular seamen who did not know the true and living God. And, and look, the verse says here that, that they feared the Lord. They weren't afraid of him. They began to reverence him and, and recognize because the sea stopped. They recognized the one who actually made the sea and even caused those waves to come. And it says that they fear him. In other words, reverence him and offer sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows to the true true and living God and in the midst of the tragedy of this prophet, in the midst of the chastising of this prophet, a whole boatload of unbelievers have become believers in the midst of this because they were obedient to what God told them to do. Didn't want to do it, but had no choice if they wanted to save their own lives. They did it and indeed they lived Guys, I would ask that you be prayerful with me as I preach around the subject. Be sure your sin will find you out. Part two. And Father, as we dive deeper into this book, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will hide me behind your cross, Father God. Let folk not see me or, or reverence me or, or think I'm doing anything so good that I'm, I'm to be spoken good of but have them to see the Christ inside of me. And, and Father God, allow these words that you have had me to preach or have me to preach for this day to be words that you have chosen for this congregation. And, and Lord, where they fit, Father God, we pray that you will place them and bless them and minister to them and teach them. And Father God, mess, uh, uh, please make them obedient to what you're saying to their hearts. And Father God, we will be ever so mindful to give your name all the honor, all the praise, in all the glory, in all that we do and say on this day and every day, as we pray in Jesus' name and for his namesake, amen. Amen. And amen. Now, how you, you had this prophet, you'll hear no more about these seamen, but you had this prophet who's just been tossed in the water, 
And, and I can only imagine he's probably thinking, finally, it's over. The sailors, they're going to be saved. <coughs> I'm in the water. I'll drown, and that'll be the end of it. And I didn't have to go and speak to Nineveh, who is the enemy of my people's. Not so fast, Mr. Jonah. Verse 17 says, Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And so we see in regard to that, him mentioning that, it is going to be a type of Christ that though he did not have to go into a grave for his sin, Christ went into a grave. He was battered and beaten and ridiculed and treated very badly, but not for his, but for ours. But that's another story for another time. This prophet had sinned, was disobedient to God, and ended up where he never thought he would end up, in the belly of a great fish. Hoping, wishing it would be all over, and realizing that it is only, hallelujah, the beginning. Chapter 2, verse 1, then Jonah prayed. And by the way, this whole chapter 2 is, is about Jonah praying. He, he's speaking to the Lord, not realizing he would be here, but now he realizes he's here, realizing that God doesn't play, realizing that I don't care where you go, you cannot escape the Lord, that he knows every aspect of your life and knows everything about you, knows when you're sinning, when you're not sinning, when you're up, when you're down, knows when you feel good and when you feel bad, he knows you. And for the believer, guys, he owns you. And when he speaks, we ought to be obedient. Verse 1, chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And, and listen, I, I, I read this and it helps me to realize because I've never been inside of a whale. But, but what I do know is that I have been in some issues and some places where I had no business being in sin. And, and listen, I had to pray from wherever the Lord allowed me to be because I was going through so much and I had no time to go to a church. And I had to solicit my prayers to the Lord because sometimes, guys, you get sick. Sometimes you get tired. Sometimes you get sick and tired of trying to do life your way. And you realize and recognize that the only way to do life is to do it God's way. And if you're in a gutter or you're in a place where you got no business being, and God brings you to not yourself but himself, that I submit that that is the time to pray. And though Jonah is in, and I can only imagine how smelly it was in there. I can only imagine how rough it was in there. But the one thing this prophet realized is that if he calls on the true and living God, that he will hear him no matter where he's at. And, and listen, I dare say this whale is going up and going down. He's trying to get he, water's coming in, seaweed and everything else. But he's trying to figure out which way is up. And that's the way he prayed. Again, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. That's key, guys. He heard you. Heard him, and he'll, he'll hear you as well if you're ready to repent, if you're ready to get back with the Lord. He says, and he heard me out of the belly look of hell. And, and listen, it could be translated Sheol. And, and that's how he feels. That's exactly where he thinks he's at. He said, out of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. And, and I dare say, guys, it doesn't much matter where you are. If you're out of order and you're ready to repent, the Lord will hear your Cries. Amen. Amen. He goes on. Verse 3. For thou hadst cast, cast me into the sea. And by the way, it says, For thou hadst cast me into the sea or into the deep. The sailors physically did it, but it was God's doing. God put him in that water. He says, In the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about, and thy billows and thy waves, he says, pass over me. 
And, and look, he's talking about everything he's going through while he was in the water and even in the belly of this whale. We know that whales have to breathe air and, and they got to blow a hole. They got to blow this water out and they can go back down to the deep and you got all this water passing <laughs> over him and he's trying to take a breath, trying to keep his thoughts straight, but he's still speaking and praying to his Lord. In verse 4 he said, then, said I, then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. And he's saying that, look, I know I'm out of fellowship, and I know even right here I'm not right with you. He said, but I'm going to call on you. Look at the verse continues. He said, <clears throat> he says, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. In other words, I know which side my bread is buttered on, and I know who does the buttering. It was me who moved, God. You didn't move, and I'm calling out to you, and I'm asking you to forgive me and bless me. He goes on in verse 5. The waters can pass me about even to the soul. The death closed me around about. The weeds, look what he says, were wrapped about my head. And guys, understand, not too long ago, he was sitting on a boat, and in fact, while they were praying, he was down there sleeping, and now he's in the belly of a whale, and this weeds and water and all this is making him not just uncomfortable, but he feels like he's ready to die, and I dare say he probably wished he could die, but God has a plan for him. God has a calling for him. And he's going to fulfill that calling. Guys, I run into a lot of people, not a lot, but a good amount, a fair amount of people. And they're living their lives in a way that's not consistent to good Christian living. And sometimes the Lord gives me a word for them and, and will help me to say to them that, look, what you're doing is not right. And sooner or later it's going to catch up with you. And you need to listen to what the Lord is saying to you right now. And they tell me, well, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and I know what I'm doing, and, and God loves me. He forgives all my sins. And, and he said, by the way, he said, we're going to be raptured out of here soon anyhow, and what difference does it make? And, and they're assuming on God's grace. Look, God gives his grace, but it's him to do with, his to do with as he sees fit. And they would rather for God to come and zap them out of here rather than live a life that's right but if God has called you to be his child, uh, one way or another, the easy way or the hard way, he's going to straighten it out or straighten you out to make your walk here on earth not make him look bad. And yes, if he says so, he'll take you home. Yep. But you're going to hit some rocky road and some rough seas and some whale of a time while you're trying to run from him. And, and listen, I've tried. You can't drown out the voice of the Lord. You can't drink it out. You can't drug it out. You can't run it out because wherever you go, he's right there. And if he's trying to get your attention and trying to get you to straighten up and walk right, he's going to do it. And you're going to have a rough time trying to fight against a holy God. Anybody here got any battle scars from fighting with a holy God? And guys, I dare say that, that there are scars that many times some of them don't heal. I, I've got issues with my body right now from boxing with God. And, and listen, he already told me like he told Paul, my grace is sufficient with you. I want you to remember every time that thing ails uh, that it was because you were running from me and I had to allow that to remind you of what I did in my past so I don't go there anymore just like he had to do with this prophet Jonah. He says in verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth, it says, with her, bar with her bars was about me forever. And, and listen, I can only imagine, he's talking about inside that whale, he's looking at his ribs, and, and they were his prison bars. He says, was about me forever. He says, yes, had thou brought me up my life from corruption. He says, O oh Lord my God. And look, before he was running, right now he realizes that that is his true and living God. And guys, by the way, if God is your problem, he's your only solution. God was the problem of those sailors in that boat and even of Jonah. 
and he is the only solution for those sailors as they had to throw him in the water, and he's the only solution for Jonah. And hallelujah. If the, and I won't say hell, I'll say the heaven hounds are on you. God is going to be the only solution that you have. And you're going to be left with doing it his way. One way, shape, or form. You might do it with one leg broke. Maybe one arm broke. <coughs> you might do it with, with disconnected from here or there. You, you might do it in a sickly fashion. You might even do it from a hospital bed. But if God says you're going to do it, guess what? I'm not a betting man. But if I was, I'd put all my money on the fact that you're going to do what he's called you to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. He says in verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. He said, they observe living vanities. Oh, I'm sorry, they that observe living vanities, he says, uh, uh, forsake their own mercy. And he's saying, those that are about themselves, I'm going to do it my way. He's saying that sooner or later, it's going to come the path that you're going to do it God's way. In verse 9, he says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. In other words, God, I told you, I'll work for you, I'll prophesy for you. Wherever you send me, I'm going to go. And God said, go to Nineveh. And the prophet said, I ain't going. And God said, we shall see. He goes on, he says, salvation is of the Lord. And, and I dare say God has him in a place where he's ready to do what he's called him to do. And hallelujah, I wasn't ever inside of a belly of a whale or a great fish, but hallelujah, he's had me in some places, and when he delivered me, I hit the ground running as well. And much of what you see here is a result of God grabbing hold of me and telling me, Brother Ralph, are you ready now to do my bidding? My last out of fellowship experience with the Lord. He helped me to know in my heart, and no, I didn't hear a voice, but he helped me to know in my heart <coughs> that Brother Ralph, if you don't straighten up, you're going to die. Now, I've had men threaten me, had women threaten me, had guns in my face. <coughs> Never really feared that that much. But when he spoke to my heart, and he said that if I don't stop, I'm going to die. I believed him. I believed him so much that I'm here with you today. And I'm not going back to that place. Because a whole lot of things I used to think I didn't care if I lived or died. Guess what? I really did care. And when God spoke to my heart and said that, I believed him. And that's what it took for me to get right and begin to grow in grace. My question is, what will it take for you or for you or for all those that are out of order and not where God's called yeah. you to be? When I look at our climate, and I'm not talking about the temperature, but I look at our worldly climate and how everything is against Christianity and against our God. I look how it gets increasingly worse day by day, not month by month, but day by day. And I see the, the, the sin of the world and, and, and the things that are encroaching us at an alarming rate. And, and I talk to a lot of folk who are professing to be Christian, and I see how they're living. And, and they're not living worth God's forgiveness in how they're conducting their lives. And I wonder, how can you live like that and say you love the Lord and, know, and say that he has saved you, yet you continue to walk in a fashion that's not pleasing in his sight? And it hurts my heart for folk I know, for family members, for people I talk to, for people I teach, for people I preach to, and I know how they're living, and it hurts my heart. I don't know how they can live that way. And, and listen, because I know I can't. And even the, the foul thoughts that come to my mind, I, I fall on my face before the Lord because I know it's not pleasing in his sight. And like this prophet who had to be put in the belly of a fish to realize the true and living God, 
is true and living and has blessed you and blessed you and blessed me. And all he does is tell me to be obedient to him. And, and listen, I can do no less but to present my body a living sacrifice. He says holy and acceptable unto him. And he says that that's my reasonable service. And if I'm his, and I'm to represent him here on this earth, I wonder just how others see me. Do they see me as a true Christian, a true man of God, a, a, a true one who has been bought out by the finished works of God? Or do they see me as a fraud? Somebody who says something one day and, and just goes and do whatever I want to do whenever I feel like doing it. And hallelujah, guys, it makes me tighten up my walk even that much more. And it makes me look for myself in God's scripture and make sure that I'm right with him. And, and listen, everybody here, you might be right, I pray, but I dare say there might be somebody here who's not right. And if you're not right, I simply ask that you ask the Lord to make you right. And like our prophet here, that you come to the realization that God's called you to a work, and that work, one way, shape, or form, you're going to fulfill it. Jonah says in verse 9 of chapter 2, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and he vomited out Jonah upon dry land. And, and listen, there's some prayers that are surface prayers. They never get past the ceiling. But I dare say the prayer that this prophet has made, that one was a true prayer that reached the ears of God, and his heart was right. And God gave commands to that fish to loose him, and loose him he did. And I dare say, if our prayers are right, that the bondages that we many times find ourselves in, that if our prayers are right and we're earnest in regard to our repentance and ask the Lord truly to forgive us, that whatever we're shackled to, the Lord will loose us as well. But we must be willing to give up what he's telling us to give up and to serve the true and living God. Amen. 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 I'm going to stop with Jonah here as we're going into our communion service. But I pray that if you're involved in something that you should not be, that if you should be involved in something and you're not, if you need to reconcile with somebody and you have not, if there's a forgiveness issue in your heart, you need to get it right with the Lord, not just so we can partake of communion, so that we can partake of God and his mercy in every aspect of every part of our lives. Amen. 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 And Father, as we close out here in this great book of Jonah, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, as we begin our communion service and remembering our elements, Lord, that we use even for this service there, Simply unleavened bread, unleavened crackers, and, and, and unsweetened grape juice, Father God. But we use them in remembrance of your broken body and remembrance of your shed blood. I pray that you will bless our elements for that use. And Lord, I ask that you would minister to each and every one here. And as we go through a few verses of scripture out of Corinthians, that you'll touch our hearts. And if we're right to partake of these elements, that you give us the go. But, Lord, if we're not right, that you shut it down and not allow us to partake of the elements when they come around. As we pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake, amen. Amen. And amen. Guys, as usual, we're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Should be page 996. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll begin our reading at verse 23 in preparation, hallelujah, of our communion service. 1 Corinthians. 
Chapter 11, and I'll begin reading at verse 23, stopping where the Lord would have me to stop. Page 7, I'm sorry, page 996, if you're using a pew Bible. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Still see a few pages turning. 996 is the page number. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. Oh, who is that? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and Paul writes here, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. He said, this do in remembrance of me. He goes on after the same manner. Also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So, guys, we see that this communion service, that this supper, this last supper, that they were celebrating with his disciples, even before he went to the cross, it wasn't about them, but it was all about Jesus Christ. And listen, even though he was alive and well at that time, he was preparing them for when he would not be there. And listen, preparing us as well, that we would remember the finished works that he was about to do, that his shed blood that was going to be shed, and his broken body, and we are to partake and remember what he has done for us in regard to salvation. In verse 26, Paul writes, For, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, he goes on, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And look, one of the issues that the Corinthian church was having is that they were treating this service as it was nothing, no big deal. They were indifferent. They were coming in. They were being uh, uh, luscious. They were drinking. Some of them were coming drunk. They were supposed to have a supper, and, and the rich were supposed to help out the poor. They were sitting there and just slobbering over food while the poor had absolutely nothing, and they were partaking of this communion as if it was nothing. And in reality, it's one of the commandments that he has left for us to partake in, and he says that we are to partake of it in a worthy manner that we're supposed to be right with him first and foremost, that he needs to be our Savior, and we need to be in right fellowship with him. No sin on this side, that side, or any side, but right smack dab in the middle of his will. He goes on and says in verse 27, For or wherefore, he says, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, coming and treating it lightly. And look, I know I'm in sin, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Everybody else will think I'm right, but God, I don't care what he thinks. I'm going to go ahead and take it. And Paul warns us in verse 30, he says, for this cause... Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And, and listen, he says the word many here, so he's saying a lot of doing this thing, and they're not doing it in the right heart. And, and because of that, they have issues in their life, ongoing issues, and some of them, when God says, I've had enough, he literally takes them home because he gets sick and tired of us assuming on his grace and us playing around with him as our Lord and our Savior. In verse 31 he says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged as children, he says, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. He goes on, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, 
and the rest will I set in order when I come. Paul is saying that we need to be right in our hearts, guys. First and foremost, we need to know Christ <coughs> as our Lord and Savior. First prerequisite. And if you don't know him, truly know him, then this table is not for you. <coughs> Secondly, we need to be in right fellowship. We need to be having no sin or involved in no known sin. And listen, we're going to take a moment to pray. If there's something you did and you know you did it and you didn't get it right, you need to clear your slate with the Lord while you're here. And if you can't get it right, if you've got a problem with anybody here, go to them and get that right. And if you can't, hallelujah, let it pass and get it right with the Lord. And the next first Sunday you will partake of God's communion. Amen. Amen. I'm going to share this quick story. There were two guys, and they were part of, they're part of the ministry, and they had a big issue with each other, so much so that one couldn't be in the other one's proximity. And we're talking about real recent, this happened. And the Lord laid on my heart, I kept praying for them, and I said, Lord, what would you have me to do? I can't let it keep going like this. And he had me to bring them together and to challenge them both that if they were truly child of the living God, that they needed to get this thing right. They needed to, however it needed to be worked out, and get it worked out as the Lord is not pleased. And it wasn't long after, maybe a few weeks, and I saw one of them. And, and in fact, I saw both of them. And they walked by, one walked by the other one. And he said, hey, how you doing? How's everything? And, and they were greeting each other. And listen, I pray it's long lasting. I pray it's done. But whatever they did, they got it right between each other. And right now, God is pleased. And my prayer is that if you need to get something right, even if it's between you and him, please, as we bow, as we take a moment, make sure your heart is right with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Let us take a moment and make sure that we're ready.